The Falling Walls Science Breakthrough of the Year 2023 in Social Sciences and Humanities. Breaking the Wall of the Female Fear Factory. How individual actions unravel patriarchy's cultures of violence. Pumla de Neocola, Nelson Mandela University. On November the 9th, 1989, I was writing my final high school examinations in Bisho. Imagine the scene. We are in a shop in the center of a cosmopolitan city somewhere in the world. Inside the shop, we notice the scene unfold. A young woman is looking through a rack of clothing, as we all are. As she does so, a young man tries to get her attention. We notice her body language, discomfort. We watch. She turns away from him. He follows her, looking even more uncomfortable. He persists. She turns her back, walks away, perhaps across the room. He follows her across the room, exasperated, frustrated. She shouts, leave me alone. His response, this is why we rape you. There's silence in the shop. A few people gasp. Perhaps we recognize something about the scene, about the young woman's response, even if not about the brazenness of the young man's retort. Another bystander, her name is Lebu Pule, responds, rushes at the young man, challenges him. What do you mean? Why is this why you rape? How many women have you raped? What is going on? The young man, taken aback, looks at her, wonders about this crazy, screaming woman, flees the scene. Now, this is an actual scene that happened. It is important because it illustrates several things about how we navigate public space. While we may not have been individually present in similar states, we recognize something about this response, perhaps about the young woman's response, the scripts that women are often told about how to avoid violence. Walk away, make yourself inconspicuous, do not aggravate. One in 10 women in the EU above the age of 15 has experienced cyber harassment, explicit, Content, sexual sent to her, advances, sexual threats. Globally, one in five women are killed per annum by an intimate partner, former intimate partner, or prospective intimate partner. One in three women are physically or sexually assaulted at least once in their lifetime. The Female Fear Factory is a theory or a model that provides us with the conceptual vocabulary to understand scenes such as the one that I've just outlined, that helps us understand why, despite countless attempts, legal, political, policy, movement, political, to end gendered violence, to end patriarchal violence across the globe in specific institutions, but also across our planet, we continue to be in the grip of gendered violence, of patriarchal violence. 
The Female Fear Factory is a theatrical public performance of patriarchal policing of women and those made female, those who approximate women, those seen as women, in order to mark them as safe to violate. Safe to violate means violatable without consequence. The Female Fear Factory uses and relies on a process that I call fluency. Fluency because it works like language. Now, I'm assuming that many people in this room speak more than one language, and you understand, of course, if you speak more than one language, that even if you're fluent in both languages, in all three languages, in all six languages, you do not occupy each of those languages exactly the same way. You understand that you are fluent in a language once you're able to understand quickly the symbols, the codes, the signs, to read without hesitation, to interpret without hesitation, to be comfortable, even if that comfort is not exactly the same across different languages. Fluency in the female fear factory is something we are all, in different ways, socialized into. So we taught the language of the female fear factory, some of the scripts that some of us recognize, even though we don't live in that particular city, have never been in that particular, in that particular shop. Fluency requires us to understand quickly the threat, what to how to respond to this threat, the scripts given to us to make ourselves smaller, or to understand that we may violate without consequence, depending on who we are. Now, I come to the Female Fear Factory through a variety of previous studies. So I initially come to it in from a study where I was trying to understand the historical and contemporary manifestations of rape um, in, in, in South Africa. So historically trying to understand why it has the particular manifestations it has in a study called um, Rape in South African Nightmare. It was simply a chapter in, 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 that, in that book. However, as I continued this work, I realized that the Female Fear Factory does not just work with rape, it does not just work in that context, that it was able to help us understand the minutiae, the specific ways in which rape culture and other forms of patriarchal violence work across the globe. And to do this, and so the, law, the, the, the project, then Female Fear Factory, which becomes its own book later on, is one in which I read more than one country. And one of the strategies I use to develop and expand and, and strengthen this notion of the female fear factory, this concept, this model, this kind of the conceptual language and the theory of the female fear factory is what I call counter, excuse me, counterintuitive analysis. And counterintuitive analysis is a strategy of comparison which challenges many of the ways in which we do comparison in the, in the academy. Whereas, for example, it makes sense, we would think, and as we proceed, to compare societies that are similar. So if we compare France and Germany, there's value in that. However, if you compare societies that are very similar, we are able to see what is shared, but we, that strategy obscures as much as it illuminates. In counterintuitive analysis, I analyzed as an experiment, which was a very productive experiment as it turned out, societies with ostensibly have nothing in common or are very different from each other. So I compare South Africa and Saudi Arabia. I compare the Netherlands and El Salvador. I compare India and the US and so on. And what this uncovers are some of the shared ways in which patriarchal violence works across societies, which then allows me to come up with the female fear factory as something that is useful analytically and perhaps to design some of the strategies of intervention in societies that are very, very different. It, it, it helps me and it helps us understand a planetary challenge in a way that allows us to adapt it as a diagnostic system to specific incidents, but also to be able to read across the globe 
um, and across different, different contexts. Now, there are challenges, I mean, there are surprises, rather. There's surprises that come from the literature. So conventionally, when we think about patriarchal violence, when we think about gendered violence, we think about very clear perpetrators and very clear, and very clear victims or, or survivors. We think very often sometimes about malice and intention and deliberate violence. One of the surprises, which was somewhat heartbreaking, I will admit, I will admit to me was the way in which the female fear factory is not simply taught to us in contexts of obvious hostility, but that it is so meticulous, so slippery, so ingrained into almost all of our societies that it is passed on in contexts of love. One of the studies that I draw from is a multitudinal long study, um, very large study, that looks at what happens on playgrounds, on the sidelines of playgrounds. And part of what the study shows, and there's numerous papers published about specific countries, but it, the study, I think, looks at 56 different countries, very different countries. And one of the unanimous findings of the study is that on the sides of the playground, parents warn girls, on average, 10 times more to be careful. They send boys out and they say, oh, I'm sorry, my boy, go back out. And girls are told constantly, be careful. Now, of course, when parents are doing this, most parents in the world, I think we can assume, do not consciously or deliberately do things to harm their children. And so the Female Fear Factory, and looking at studies like this, um, the Female Fear Factory is then, it really is, is important to think about the Female Fear Factory not only within these dynamics of deliberate harm, but to think about the ways in which it complicates what we might think about as complicity, what we might think about as our own location within it. And perhaps this then begins to explain to us why it is so enduring. Why, even when we come up with so many ways to understand gender-based violence, violence against women, violence against queers, patriarchal violences of, 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 of various kinds, we continue to live um, in, its, in, its, in its grip. I come up with strategies that allow for individual and um, collective interruption of the female fear factory through a process I call both interrupting the female fear factory and demastery. If fluency is crucial to the female fear factory, then unlearning the fluency, denaturalizing, making us aware of the signs, of the cues that we otherwise take for granted as just life, is part of beginning the work of unraveling and undoing the female fear factory. We know that as we go through our lives, we often miss many things because we've been so su su um, successfully socialized into reading them. However, freezing time, pausing, make us, making us think about something we might otherwise gloss over, can sometimes offer us the chance to notice what is obscene. And demastery, then, is a string of strategies that allows us to pause, to pay attention to what we might otherwise um, flow over. And of course, when we think about violence, very often we think, oh my goodness, if it's planetary and it's old and it is all of these things, what can one person do? And so it becomes important in my work against the female fear factory, because I design it, but ultimately my project as a feminist is against, I write against the female fear factory. I'm thinking against the female fear factory. The interruption of the female fear factory, the demastery strategies are in order to take it, to take it apart. And this is why it's important to think then about moments like the moment on which I started this talk with you today, that moment where one person shifts what is possible in the room, moving fear from the perpetrator who is safe to violate 
sorry, from the violated to the perpetrator who, until that moment, imagines himself safe to violate at whim. Now, imagine what we could achieve if one half of humanity didn't spend so much time needing to be vigilant. Imagine what we as human beings faced with multiple crises at this time could create, could imagine, could innovate if that part of the brain that is constantly in fear, vigilant, were free to do the unimaginable. Thank you.